This is a short story by Flannery O'Connor called Good Country People. Besides the neutral expression that she wore when she was alone, Mrs. Freeman had two others, forward and reverse, that she used for all her human dealings. Her forward expression was steady and driving like the advance of a heavy truck. Her eyes never swerved to left or right, but turned as the story turned, as if they followed a yellow line down the center of it. She seldom used the other expression because it was not often necessary for her to retract a statement, but when she did, her face came to a complete stop. There was almost an imperceptible movement of her black eyes, during which they seemed to be receding, and then the observer would see that Mrs. Freeman, though she might stand there as real as several grain sacks thrown on top of each other, was no longer there in spirit. As for getting anything across to her when this was the case, Mrs. Hopewell had given it up. She might talk her head off. Mrs. Freeman could never be brought to admit herself wrong on any point. She would stand there, and if she could be brought to say anything, it was something like, Well, I wouldn't have said it, and I wouldn't have said it wasn't. Or letting her gaze range over the top shelf in the kitchen where there was an assortment of dusty bottles. She might remark, I see you ain't ate many of them figs you put up last summer. They carried on their most important business in the kitchen at breakfast. Every morning, Mrs. Hopewell got up at 7 o'clock and lit a gas heater in Joy's. Joy was her daughter, a large blonde girl who had an artificial leg. Mrs. Hopewell thought of her as a child, though she was 32 years old and highly educated. Joy would get up while her mother was eating and lumber into the bathroom and slam the door, and before long, Mrs. Freeman would arrive at the back door. Joy would hear her mother call, Come on in! And then they would talk for a while in low voices that were indistinguishable in the bathroom. By the time Joy came in, they had usually finished the weather report and were on one or the other of Mrs. Freeman's daughters, Glenice or Caramay. Joy called them Glycerin and Caramel. Glenice, a redhead, was 18 and had many admirers. Caramay, a blonde, was only 15 but already married and pregnant. She could not keep anything on her stomach. Every morning, Mrs. Freeman told, told Mrs. Hopewell how many times she had vomited since the last report. Mrs. Hopewell liked to tell people that Glenys and Caramay were two of the finest girls she knew and that Mrs. Freeman was a lady and that she was never ashamed to take her anywhere or introduce her to anybody that they might meet. Then she would tell how she had happened to hire the Freemans in the first place and how they were a godsend to her and how she had had them four years. The real reason for keeping them so long was that they were not trash. They were good country people. She had telephoned the man whose name they had given as a reference, and he had told her that Mr. Freeman was a good farmer, but his wife was the nosiest woman ever to walk the earth. She's got to be into everything, the man said. If she don't get there before the dust settles, you can bet she's dead, that's all. She wants to know all your business. I can stand him real good, he had said, but me nor my wife neither could have had stood that woman one more minute on this place. That had put Mrs. Hopewell off for a few days. She had hired them in the end because there were no other applicants, but she had made up her mind beforehand exactly how she would handle the woman. Since she was the type who had been into everything, then Mrs. Hopewell had decided she would not only let her be into everything, she would see to it she was into everything. She would give her the responsibility of everything. She would put her in charge. Mrs. Hopewell had no bad qualities of her own, but she was able to use other people's in such a constructive way that she never felt the lack. She had hired the Freemans, and she had kept them four years. Nothing was perfect. This was one of Mrs. Hopewell's favorite sayings. Another one was, That is life. And still another, the most important, was, Well, other people have their opinions, too. She would make these statements, usually at the table, in a tone of gentle insistence, as if no one held them but her. And the large hulk and joy, whose constant outrage had obliterated every expression from her face, would stare just a little to the side of her, her eyes icy blue, with the look of someone who has achieved blindness by an act of will and means to keep it. When Mrs. Hopewell said it to Mrs. Freeman that life was like that, Mrs. Freeman would say, I always said so myself. Nothing had been arrived at by anyone that had not first been arrived at by her. She was quicker than Mr. Freeman. When Mrs. Hopewell said to her after they had been on the place a while, You know, you're the wheel behind the wheel, and winked. Mrs. Freeman had said, I know it. I've always been quick. It's some that are quicker than others. Everybody's different, Mrs. Hopewell said. Yes, most people is, Mrs. Freeman said. It takes all kinds to make the world. I always said it did myself. The girl was used to this kind of dialogue for breakfast and more of it for dinner. Sometimes they had it for supper, too. When they had no guests, they ate in the kitchen because that was easier. 
Mrs. Freeman always managed to arrive at some point during the meal and to watch him finish it. She would stand in the doorway if it was summer, but in the winter she would stand with one elbow on top of the refrigerator and look down on him, or she would stand by the gas heater, lifting the back of her skirt slightly. Occasionally she would stand against the wall and roll her head from side to side. At no time was she in any hurry to leave. All this was very trying on Mrs. Hopewell, but she was a woman of great patience. She realized that nothing is perfect, and that in the Freemans she had good country people, and that if, in this day and age, you get good country people, you had better hang on to them. She had plenty of experience with trash. Before the Freemans, she had averaged one tenant family a year. The wives of these farmers were not the kind you would want to be around you for very long. Mrs. Hopewell, who had divorced her husband long ago, needed someone to walk over the fields with her, and when Joy had to be impressed for these services, her remarks were usually so ugly and her face so glum that Mrs. Hopewell would say, If you can't come pleasantly, I don't want you at all. To which the girl, standing square and rigid shoulders with her neck thrust slightly forward, would reply, If you want me, here I am, like I am. Mrs. Hopewell excused this attitude because of the leg, which had been shot off in a hunting accident when Joy was ten. It was hard for Mrs. Hopewell to realize that her child was thirty-two now and that for more than twenty years she had had only one leg. She thought of her still as a child because it tore her heart out to think instead of the poor stout girl in her thirties who had never danced a step or had any normal good times. Her name was really Joy, but as soon as she was twenty-one and away from home she had it legally changed. Mrs. Hopewell was certain that she had thought and thought until she had hit upon the ugliest name in any language. Then she had gone and had changed a beautiful name, Joy, changed without telling her mother until after she had done it. Her legal name was Hulga. When Mrs. Hopewell thought the name Hulga, she thought of the broad blank hull of a battleship. She would not use it. She continued to call it Joy, to which the girl responded, but in a purely mechanical way. Hulga had learned to tolerate Mrs. Freeman, who had saved her from taking walks with her mother. Even Glenice and Caramay were useful when they occupied attention that might otherwise have been directed at her. At first she had thought she could not stand Mrs. Freeman, for she had found that it was not possible to be rude to her. Mrs. Freeman would take on strange resentments, and for days together she would be sullen, but the source of her displeasure was always obscure. A direct attack, a positive leer, blatant ugliness to her face, these never touched her. And without warning, one day she began calling her Hulga. She did not call her that in front of Mrs. Hopewell, who would have been incensed, but when she and the girl happened to be out of the house together, she would say something and add the name Hulga to the end of it, and the big spectacled Joy Hulga would scowl and redden as if her privacy had been intruded upon. She considered the name her personal affair. She had arrived at it first purely on the basis of its ugly sound, and then the full genius of its fitness had struck her. She had a vision of the name working like the ugly, sweating Vulcan who stayed in the furnace and to whom, presumably, the goddess had come when called. She saw it as the name of her highest creative act. One of her major triumphs was that her mother had not been able to turn her dust into joy, but the greater one was that she had been able to turn it herself into Holga. However, Mrs. Freeman's relish for using the name only irritated her. It was as if Mrs. Freeman's beady steel-pointed eyes had penetrated far enough behind her face to reach some secret fact. Something about her seemed to fascinate Mrs. Freeman, and then one day Hulga realized that it was the artificial leg. Mrs. Freeman had a special fondness for the details of secret infections, hidden deformities, assaults upon children. Of diseases, she preferred the lingering of, or incurable. Hoga had heard Mrs. Hopewell give her the details of the hunting accident, how the leg had been literally blasted off, how she had never lost consciousness. Mrs. Freeman could listen to it any time as if it had happened an hour ago. When Hoga stumped into the kitchen in the morning, she could walk without making the awful noise, but she made it. Mrs. Hopewell was certain because it was ugly sounding. She glanced at them and did not speak. Mrs. Hopewell would be in her red kimono with her hair tied around her head in rags. She would be sitting at the table, finishing her breakfast, and Mrs. Freeman would be hanging her by her elbow outward from the refrigerator, looking down at the table. Olga always put her eggs on the stove to bowl, and then stood over them with her arms folded, and Mrs. Hopewell would look at her. A kind of indirect gaze divided between her and Mrs. Freeman, and would think that if she would only keep herself up a little, she wouldn't be so bad looking. There was nothing wrong with her face that a pleasant expression wouldn't help. Mrs. Hopewell said that people who looked on the bright side of things would be beautiful even if they were not. 
Whenever she looked at Joy this way, she could not help but feel that it would be, have been better if the child had not taken the Ph.D. It had certainly not brought her out any, and now that she had it, there was no more excuse for her to go to school again. Mrs. Hopewell thought it was nice for girls to go to school and to have a good time, but Joy had gone through. Anyhow, she would not have been strong enough to go again. The doctors had told Mrs. Hopewell that with the best of care, Joy might see 45. She had a weak heart. Joy had made it plain that if it had not been for this condition, she would be far from these red hills and good country people. She would be in a university lecturing to people who knew what she was talking about. And Mrs. Hopewell could very well picture her there, looking like a scarecrow and lecturing to more of the same. Here she went about all day in a six-year-old skirt and a yellow sweatshirt with a faded cowboy on a horse embossed on it. She thought this was funny. Mrs. Hopewell thought it was idiotic and showed simply that she was still a child. She was brilliant, but she didn't have a grain of sense. It seemed to Mrs. Hopewell that every year she grew less like other people and more like herself, bloated, rude, and squint-eyed. And she said such strange things. To her own mother, she had said, without warning, without excuse, standing up in the middle of a meal with her face purple and her mouth half full, Woman, do you ever look inside? Do you not ever look inside and see what you are not? God! She had cried, sinking down again and staring at her plate. Malabranch was right. We are not our own light. We are not our own light. Mrs. Hopewell had no idea to this day what brought that on. She had only made the remark, hoping Joy would take it in, that a smile never hurt anyone. The girl had taken the Ph.D. in philosophy, and this left Mrs. Hopewell at a complete loss. You could say, my daughter is a nurse, or my daughter is a school teacher, or even my daughter is a chemical engineer. You could not say, my daughter is a philosopher. That was something that had ended with the Greeks and Romans. All day, Joy sat on the neck in a deep chair, reading. Sometimes she went for walks, but she didn't like dogs or cats or birds or flowers or nature or nice young men. She looked at nice young men as if she could smell their stupidity. One day, Mrs. Hopewell had picked up one of the books that the girl had just put down and opened it at random. She read, Science, on the other hand, has to assert its soberness and seriousness afresh and declare that it is concerned solely with what is. Nothing. How can it be for science anything but a horror and a phantasm? If science is right, then one thing stands firm. Science wishes to know nothing of nothing, such as, after all, the strictly scientific approach to nothing. We know it by wishing to know nothing of nothing. These words had been underlined with a blue pencil, and they worked on Mrs. Hopewell like some evil incantation and gibberish. She shut the book quickly and went out of the room as if she were having a chill. This morning, when the girl came in, Mrs. Freeman was on caramay. She thrown up four times after supper, she said. Was up twice during the night after three o'clock. Yesterday, she didn't do nothing but ramble in the bureau drawer. All she did, stand up there and see what she could run up on. She's got to eat, Mrs. Hopewell muttered, sipping her coffee while she watched Joy's back at the stove. She was wondering what the child had said to the Bible salesman. She could not imagine what kind of a conversation she could possibly have had with him. It was a tall, gaunt, hatless youth who had called yesterday to sell them a Bible. He had appeared at the door, carrying a large black suitcase that weighted him so heavily on one side that he had to brace himself against the door facing. He seemed on the point of collapse, but he said in a cheerful voice, Good morning, Mrs. Cedars, and set the suitcase down on the mat. He was not a bad-looking young man, though he had on a bright blue suit and yellow socks that were not pulled up far enough. He had prominent face bones and a streak of sticky-looking brown hair falling across his forehead. I'm Mrs. Hopewell, she said. Oh, he said, pretending to look puzzled, but with his eyes sparkling. I saw it said the Cedars on the mailbox, so I thought you was Mrs. Cedars. And he burst out in a pleasant laugh. He picked up the satchel and under a cover of a pant, he fell forward into her hall. It was rather as if the suitcase had moved first, jerking him after it. Mrs. Hopewell, he said, and grabbed her hand. I hope you are well. And he laughed again, and then all at once a face sober completely. He paused and gave her a straight, earnest look and said, Lady... I've come to speak of serious things. Well, come in, she muttered, none too pleased because the dinner was almost ready. He came into the parlor and sat down on the edge of a straight chair and put the suitcase between his feet and glanced around the room as if he were sizing her up by it. Her silver gleamed on the two sideboards. She decided he had never been in a room as elegant as this. Mrs. Hopewell, he began, using her name in a way that sounded almost intimate. I know you believe in Christian service. Well, yes, she murmured. I know, he said, and paused, looking very wise with his head cocked on one side, that you're a good woman. Friends have told me. Mrs. Hopewell never liked to be taken for a fool. What are you selling? 
she asked. Bibles, the young man said, and his eye raced around the room before he added, I see you have no family Bible in your parlor. I see that is the one lack you got. Mrs. Hopewell could not say, My daughter is an atheist and won't let me keep the Bible in the parlor. She said, stiffening slightly, I keep my Bible by my bedside. This was not the truth. It was in the attic somewhere. Lady, he said, the word of God ought to be in the parlor. Well, I think it's a matter of taste, she began. I think, lady, he said, for a Christian, the word of God ought to be in every room in the house besides in his heart. I know you're a Christian because I can see it in every line of your face. She stood up and said, well, young man, I don't want to buy a Bible. I smell my dinner burning. He didn't get up. He began to twist his hands and looking down at them, he said softly, Well, lady, I'll tell you the truth. Not many people want to buy one nowadays, and besides, I know I'm real simple. I don't know how to say a thing but to say it. I'm just a country boy. He glanced up into her unfriendly face. People like you don't like to fool with country people like me. Why, she cried, good country people are the salt of the earth. Besides, we all have different ways of doing. It takes all kinds to make the world go round. That's life. You said a mouthful. He said, Why, well, I think there aren't enough good country people in the world, she said, stirred. I think that's what's wrong with it. His face had brightened. I didn't introduce myself, he said. I'm Manly Pointer for out in the country around Willowby, not even from a place, just from near a place. You wait a minute, she said. I have to see about my dinner. She went out to the kitchen and found Joy standing near the door where she'd been listening. Get rid of the salt of the earth, she said, and let's eat. Mrs. Hopewell gave her a pained look and turned the heat down under the vegetables. I can't be rude to anybody, she murmured, and went back to the parlor. He had opened the suitcase up and was sitting with a Bible on each knee. You might as well put those up, she told him. I don't want one. I appreciate your honesty, he said. You don't see any more real honest people unless you go way out in the country. I know, she said. Real genuine folks. Through the crack in the door, she heard a groan. I guess a lot of boys come telling you they're working their way through college, he said, but I'm not going to tell you that. Somehow, he said, I don't want to go to college. I want to devote my life to Christian service. See, he said lower in his voice, I got this heart condition. I may not live long. When you know there's something wrong with you, then you may not live long. Well, then, lady, he paused with his mouth open and stared at her. He and Joy had the same condition. She knew that her eyes were filling with tears, but she collected herself quickly and murmured, Won't you stay for dinner? We'd love to have you. It was sorry the instant she heard herself say it. Yes, ma'am, he said in a bashed voice. i sure love to do that. Joy had given him one look on being introduced to him and then throughout the meal had not glanced at him again. He had addressed several remarks to her, which she had pretended not to hear. Mrs. Hopewell could not understand deliberate rudeness, although she lived with it, and she felt she always had to overflow with hospitality to make up for Joy's lack of courtesy. She urged him to talk about himself, and he did. He said he was the seventh child of twelve, and that his father had been crushed under a tree when he himself was eight years old. He had been crushed very badly, in fact, almost cut in two, and was practically not recognizable. His mother had got along the best she could by hard working, and she had always seen that her children went to Sunday school and that they read the Bible every evening. He was now 19 years old and had been selling Bibles for four months. In that time, he had sold 77 Bibles and had the promise of two more sales. He wanted to become a missionary because he thought that was the way you could do for most people. He who loses his life shall find it, he said simply. And he was so sincere, so genuine and earnest that Mrs. Hopewell would not for the world have smiled. He prevented his peas from sliding onto the table by blocking them with a piece of bread which he later cleaned his plate with. She could see Joy observing. Sidewise, how he handled his knife and fork, and she saw, too, that every few minutes the boy would dart a keen, appraising glance at the girl as if he were trying to attract her attention. After dinner, Joy cleared the dishes off the table and disappeared, and Mrs. Hopewell was left to talk with him. He told her again about his childhood and his father's accident and about various things that had happened to him. Every five minutes or so, she would stifle a yawn. He sat for two hours until finally she told him she must go because she had an appointment in town. He packed his Bibles and thanked her and prepared to leave, but in the doorway he stopped and wrung a hand and said that not on any of his trips had he met a lady as nice as her, and he asked if he could come again. She had said she would always be happy to see him. Joy had been standing in the road, apparently looking at something in the distance when he came down the steps toward her, bent to the side with his heavy valise. He stopped where she was standing and confronted her directly. Mrs. Hopewell could not hear what he said, but she trembled to think what Joy would say to him. 
She could see that after a minute, Joy said something that the boy began to speak again, making an excited gesture with his free hand. After a minute, Joy said something else at which the boy began to speak. Once more, then to her amazement, Mrs. Hopewell saw the two of them walk off together toward the gate. Joy had walked all the way to the gate with him, and Mrs. Hopewell could not imagine what they had said to each other, and she had not yet dared to ask. Mrs. Freeman was insistent upon her attention. She had moved from the refrigerator to the heater so that Mrs. Hopewell had to turn and face her in order to seem to be listening. Glenny's gone out with Harvey Hill again last night, she said. She had this sty. Hill, Mrs. Hopewell said absently. Is that the one who works in the garage? No, she's the one who goes to chiropractic school, Mrs. Freeman said. She had this sty, been had it two days. So she says when he brought her in the other night, he says, let me get rid of that sty for you. And she says, how? And he says, you just lay yourself down across the seat of the car and I'll show you. So she done it and he popped her neck. Kept on a popping it several times until she made him quit. This morning, Mrs. Freeman said, she ain't got no sty. She ain't got no traces of a sty. I never heard of that before, Mrs. Hopewell said. He asked her to marry him before the ordinary. Mrs. Freeman went on, and she told him she wasn't going to be married in no office. Well, Glenice is a fine girl, Mrs. Hopewell said. Glenice and Karen May are both fine girls. Karen May said when her and Lyman was married, Lyman said it sure felt sacred to him. She said he said he wouldn't take $500 for being married by a preacher. How much would he take? The girl asked from the stove. He said he wouldn't take $500, Mrs. Freeman repeated. Well, we all have work to do, Mrs. Hopewell said. Lyman said it just felt more sacred to him, Mrs. Freeman said. The doctor wants Caramay to eat prunes. Says instead of medicine, says them cramps is coming from pressure. You know where I think it is? She'll be better in a few weeks, Mrs. Hopewell said. In the tube, Mrs. Freeman said, else she wouldn't be as sick as she is. Olga had cracked her two eggs into a saucer and was bringing them to the table along with a cup of coffee that she had filled too full. She sat down carefully and began to eat, meaning to keep Mrs. Freeman there by questions if for any reason she showed an inclination to leave. She could perceive a mother's eye on her. The first roundabout question would be about the Bible salesman, and she did not wish to bring it on. How did he pop her neck? she asked. Mrs. Freeman went into a description how he had popped her neck. She said he owned a 55 Mercury, but Glenice said she would rather marry a man with only a 36 Plymouth who would be married by a preacher. The girl asked what if he had a 32 Plymouth, and Mrs. Freeman said what Glenice had said was a 36 Plymouth. Mrs. Hopewell said there were not many girls with Glenice's common sense. She said what she admired in those girls was their common sense. She said that reminded her that they had a nice visitor yesterday, a young man selling Bibles. Lord, she said, he bored me to death, but he was so sincere and genuine I couldn't be rude to him. He was just good country people, you know, she said, just the salt of the earth. I seen him walk up, Mrs. Freeman said, and then later I seen him walk off. And Olga could feel the slight shift in her voice, the slight insinuation that he had not walked off alone, had he? Her face remained expressionless, but the color rose into her neck and she seemed to swallow it down with the next spoonful of egg. Mrs. Freeman was looking at her as if they had a secret together. Well, it takes all kinds of people to make the world go round, Mrs. Hopewell said. It's very good what we aren't all alike. Some people more alike than others, Mrs. Freeman said. Olga got up and stumped with about twice the noise that was necessary into her room and locked the door. She was to meet the Bible salesman at 10 o'clock at the gate. She had thought about it half the night. She had started thinking of it as a great joke, and then she had begun to see profound implications in it. She had lain in bed imagining dialogues for them that were insane on the surface but that reached below to depths that no Bible salesman would be aware of. Their conversation yesterday had been of this kind. He had stopped in front of her and simply stood there. His face was bony and sweaty and bright with a little pointed nose in the center of it, and his look was different from what it had been at the dinner table. He was gazing at her with an open curiosity, with fascination, like a child watching a new fantastic animal at the zoo, and he was breathing as if he had run a great distance to reach her. His gaze seemed somehow familiar, but she could not think where she had been regarded with it before. For almost a minute, he didn't say anything. Then on what seemed to be an insuck of breath, he whispered, You ever ate a chicken that was two days old? The girl looked at him stonily. He might have just put this question up for consideration at the meeting of the Philosophical Association. Yes, she presently replied, as if she had considered it from all angles. It must have been mighty small, 
he said triumphantly, and shook all over with little nervous giggles, getting very red in the face and subsiding finally into his gaze of complete admiration, while the girl's expression remained exactly the same. How old are you? he asked softly. She waited some time before she answered. Then in a flat voice she said, Seventeen. His smiles came in succession like waves breaking on the surface of a little lake. I see you've got a wooden leg, he said. I think you're brave. I think you're real sweet. The girl stood blank and solid and silent. Walk to the gate with me, he said. You're a brave, sweet little thing, and I liked you the minute I seen you walk in the door. Hulga began to move forward. What's your name? he asked, smiling down on the top of her head. Hulga, she said. Hulga, he murmured. Hulga, Hulga. I never heard anybody named Hulga before. You're shy, aren't you, Hulga? he asked, watching his large red hand on the handle of the giant valise. I like girls that wear glasses, he said. I think a lot. I'm not like these people that a serious thought don't ever enter their heads. It's because I may die. I may die too, she said suddenly and looked up at him. His eyes were very small and brown, glittering feverishly. Listen, he said, don't you think some people was meant to meet on account of what all they got in common and all? Like they both think serious thoughts and all? He shifted the ballast to his other hand so that the hand nearest her was free. He caught hold of her elbow and shook it a little. I don't work on Saturday, he said. I like to walk in the woods and see what Mother Nature is wearing, or the hills and far away, picnics and things. Couldn't we go on a picnic tomorrow? Say yes, Holga, he said, and gave her a dying look as if he felt his insides about to drop out of him. He had even seemed to sway slightly toward her. During the night, she imagined that she seduced him. She imagined that the two of them walked on the place until they came to the storage barn beyond the two back fields, and there she imagined that things came to such a pass that she very easily seduced him, and that then, of course, she had to reckon with his remorse. True genius can get an idea across even to an inferior mind. She imagined that she took his remorse in hand and changed it into a deeper understanding of life. She took all his shame away and turned it into something useful. She set off for the gate at exactly ten o'clock, escaping without drawing Mrs. Hopewell's attention. She didn't take anything to eat, forgetting that food is usually taken on a picnic. She wore a pair of slacks and a dirty white shirt, and as an afterthought she had put some vapex on the collar of it since she did not own any perfume. When she reached the gate, no one was there. She looked up and down the empty highway and had the furious feeling that she had been tricked. They had only meant to make a walk to the gate after the idea of him. Then suddenly he stood up, very tall, from behind a bush on the opposite embankment. Smiling, he lifted his hat, which was new and wide-brimmed. He had not worn it yesterday, and she wondered if he had bought it for the occasion. It was toast-colored, with a red and white band around it, and was slightly too large for him. He stepped from behind the bush, still carrying the black valise. He had on the same suit and the same yellow socks sucked down in his shoes from walking. He crossed the highway and said, I knew you'd come. The girl wondered acidly how he'd known this. She pointed to the valise and asked, Why'd you bring your Bibles? He took her elbow, smiling down on her as if he could not stop. You can never tell when you'll need the word of God, Holga, he said. She had a moment in which she doubted that this was actually happening, and then they began to climb the embankment. They went down into the pasture toward the woods. The boy walked lightly by her side, bouncing on his toes. The ballast did not seem to be heavy today. He even swung it. They crossed half the pasture without saying anything, and then, putting his hand easily on the small of her back, he asked softly, Where's your wooden leg joint on? She turned an ugly red and glared at him for an instant. The boy looked abashed. I didn't mean you no harm, he said. I only meant you're so brave and all. I guess God takes care of you. No, she said, looking forward and walking fast. I don't even believe in God. At this he stopped and whistled. No, he exclaimed as if he were too astonished to say anything else. She walked on and in a second he was bouncing out of his side, fanning with his hat. That's very unusual for a girl, he remarked, watching her out of the corner of his eye. When they reached the edge of the wood, he put his hand on her back again and drew her against him without a word and kissed her heavily. The kiss, which had more pressure than feeling behind it, produced that extra surge of adrenaline that in the girl that enables one to carry a packed trunk out of a burning house, but in her, the power went at once to the brain. Even before he released her, her mind, clear and detached and ironic anyway, was regarding him from a great distance with amusement, but with pity. She had never been kissed before, and she was pleased to discover that it was an unexceptional experience and all a matter of the mind's control. Some people might enjoy drain water if they were told it was vodka. 
When the boy, looking expectant but uncertain, pushed her gently away, she turned and walked on, saying nothing, as if such business for her were common enough. He came along panting at her side, trying to help her when he saw a root that she might trip over. He caught and held back the long swaying blades of thorn vine until she had passed beyond them. She led the way and he came breathing heavily behind her. Then they came out on a sunlit hillside, sloping softly into another one a little smaller. Beyond, they could see the rusted top of the old barn where the extra hay was stored. The hill was sprinkled with small pink weeds. Then you ain't safe? He asked suddenly, stopping. The girl smiled. It was the first time she had smiled at him at all. In my economy, she said, I'm saved and you were damned, but I told you I didn't believe in God. Nothing seemed to destroy the boy's look of admiration. He gazed at her now as if the fantastic animal at the zoo had put its paw through the bars and given him a loving poke. She thought he looked as if he wanted to kiss her again, and she walked on before he had the chance. Ain't there somewhere as we can sit down sometime? He murmured, his voice softening toward the end of the sentence. In that barn, she said. They made for it rapidly as if it might slide away like a train. It was a large two-story barn, cool and dark inside. The boy pointed up at the ladder that led into the loft and said, It's too bad we can't go up there. Why can't we? She asked. Your leg? He said reverently. The girl gave him a contemptuous look and putting both hands on the ladder, she climbed it while he stood below, apparently awestruck. She pulled herself expertly through the opening and then looked down at him and said, Well, come on if you're coming. And he began to climb the ladder, awkwardly bringing the suitcase with him. We won't need the Bible, she observed. Never can tell, he said, panting. After he had got to the loft, he had, it was a few seconds catching his breath. She had sat down on a pile of straw, and a wide sheath of sunlight filled with dust particles slanted over her. She lay back against a bale, her face turned away, looking out the front opening of the barn where hay was thrown from a wagon into the loft. The two pink speckled hillsides lay back against a dark ridge of woods. The sky was cloudless and cold blue. The boy dropped down by her side and put one arm under her and the other over her and began methodically kissing her face, making little noises like a fish. He did not remove his hat, but it was pushed far enough back not to interfere. When her glasses got in his way, he took them off of her and slipped them into his pocket. The girl at first did not return any of the kisses, but presently she began to, and after she had put several on his cheek, she reached his lips and remained there, kissing him again and again as if she were trying to draw all the breath out of him. His breath was clear and sweet like a child's, and the kisses were sticky like a child's. He mumbled about loving her and about knowing when he first seen her that he loved her, but the mumbling was like the sleepy fretting of a child being put to sleep by his mother. Her mind, throughout this, never stopped or lost itself for a second to her feelings. You ain't said you love me none, he whispered finally, pulling back from her. You got to say that. She looked away from him off into the hollow sky and men down at a black ridge and then down farther into what appeared to be two green swelling lakes. She didn't realize he had taken her glasses, but this landscape could not seem exceptional to her for she seldom paid any close attention to her surroundings. You got to say it, he repeated. You got to say you love me. She was always careful how she committed herself. In a sense, she began, if you use that word loosely, you might say that. But it's not a word I use. I don't have illusions. I'm one of those people who see through to nothing. The boy was frowning. You got to say it. I said it, and you got to say it, he said. The girl looked at him almost tenderly. You poor baby, she murmured. It's just as well you don't understand. And she pulled him by the neck, face down against her. We are all damned, she said, but some of us have taken off our blindfolds and see that there's nothing to see. It's a kind of salvation. The boy's astonished eyes looked blankly through the ends of her hair. Okay, he almost whined, but do you love me or don't you? Yes, she said and added, in a sense. But I must tell you something. There mustn't be anything dishonest between us. She lifted his head and looked him in the eye. I'm 30 years old, she said. I have a number of degrees. The boy's look was irritated but dogged. I don't care, he said. I don't care a thing about what all you done. I just want to know if you love me or don't you. And he called her to him and wildly planted her face with kisses until she said, Yes, yes. Okay, then, he said, letting her go. Prove it. She smiled, looking dreamily out on the shifty landscape. She had seduced him without even making up her mind to try. How? she asked, feeling that he should be delayed a little. He leaned over and put his lips to her ear. Show me where your wooden leg joins on, he whispered. The girl uttered a sharp little cry and her face instantly drained her color.
The obscenity of the suggestion was not what shocked her. As a child, she had sometimes been subject to feelings of shame, but education had removed the last traces of that as a good surgeon scrapes for cancer. She would no more have felt it over what he was asking than she would have believed in his Bible. But she was as sensitive about the artificial leg as a peacock about his tail. No one ever touched it but her. She took care of it as if someone else would his soul in private and almost with her own eyes turned away. No, she said. I known it, he muttered, sitting up. You're just playing me for a sucker. Oh, no, no, she cried. It joins on at the knee, only at the knee. Why do you want to see it? The boy gave her a long, penetrating look. Because, he said, it's what makes you different. You ain't like anybody else. She sat staring at him. There was nothing about her face or her round, freezing blue eyes to indicate that this had moved her, but she had felt as if her heart had stopped and left her mind to pump her blood. She decided that for the first time in her life she was face to face with real innocence. This boy, with an instinct that came from beyond wisdom, had touched the truth about her. When after a minute she said in a hoarse, high voice, All right, it was like surrendering to him completely. It was like losing her own life and finding it again, miraculously, in his. Very gently, he began to roll the slack leg up. The artificial limb and a white sock and brown flat shoe was bound in a heavy material like canvas and ended in an ugly jointure where it was attached to the stump. The boy's face and his voice were entirely reverent. As he uncovered it and said, Now show me how to take it off and on. She took it off for him and put it back on again, and then he took it off himself, handling it as tenderly as if it were a real one. See? he said with a delighted child's face. Now I can do it myself. Put it back on, she said. She was thinking that she would run away with him and that every night he would take the leg off and every morning put it back on again. Put it back on, she said. Not yet, he murmured, setting it on its foot out of her reach. Leave it off for a while. You got me instead. She gave a little cry of alarm, but he pushed her down and began to kiss her again. Without the leg, she felt entirely dependent on him. Her brain seemed to have stopped thinking altogether and to be about some other function that it was not very good at. Different expressions raced back and forth over her face. Every now and then, the boy, his eyes like two steel spikes, would glance behind him where the leg stood. Finally, she pushed him off and said, Put it back on me now. Wait, he said. He leaned the other way and pulled the ballast toward him and opened it. It had a pale blue spotted line and there were only two Bibles in it. He took one of these out and opened the cover of it. It was hollow and contained a pocket flask of whiskey, a pack of cards, and a small blue box with printing on it. He laid these out in front of her one at a time in an evenly spaced row like one presenting offerings at the shrine of a goddess. He put the blue box in her hand. This is a product to be used only for the prevention of disease, she read, and dropped it. The boy was unscrewing the top of the flask. He stopped and pointed with a smile to the deck of cards. It was not an ordinary deck, but one with an obscene picture on the back of each card. Take a swig, he said, offering her the bottle first. He held it in front of her, but like one mesmerized, she did not move. Her voice, when she spoke, had an almost pleading sound. Aren't you, she murmured, aren't you just good country people? The boy cocked his head. He looked as if he were just beginning to understand that she might be trying to insult him. Yeah? he said, curling his lips slightly, but it ain't held me back none. I'm as good as you any day in the week. Give me my leg, she said. He pushed it farther away with his foot. Come on now, let's begin to have us a good time, he said coaxingly. We ain't got to know one another good yet. Give me my leg, she screamed and tried to lunge for it, but he pushed her down easily. What's the matter with you all of a sudden, he asked, frowning as he screwed the top on the flask and put it quickly back inside the Bible. You just a while ago said you didn't believe in nothing. I thought you were some girl. Her face was almost purple. You're a Christian, she hissed. You're a fine Christian. You're just like them all. Say one thing and do another. You're a perfect Christian. You're... The boy's mouth was set angrily. I hope you don't think, he said in a lofty, indignant tone, that I believe in that crap. I may sell Bibles, but I know which end is up, and I wasn't born yesterday, and I know where I'm going. Give me my leg, she screeched. He jumped up so quickly that she barely saw him sweep the cards and the blue box into the Bible and throw the Bible into the valise. She saw him grab the leg and then she saw it for an instant slanted forlornly across the inside of the suitcase with the Bible at either end of its opposite ends. He slammed the lid shut and snatched up the valise and swung it down through the hole and stepped through himself. 
When all of them had passed but his head, he turned and regarded her with a look that no longer had any admiration in it. I've gotten a lot of interesting things, he said. One time I got a woman's glass eye this way, and you needn't think you'll catch me because Point ain't really my name. I use a different name at every house. I call that and don't stay nowhere long. And I'll tell you another thing, Hulga, he said, using the name as if he didn't think much of it. You ain't so smart. I've been believing in nothing ever since I was born. And then the toast-colored hat disappeared down the hole and the girl was left sitting on the straw in the dusty sunlight. When she turned her churning face toward the opening, she saw his blue figure struggling successfully over the green speckled lake. Mrs. Hopewell and Mrs. Freeman, who were in the back pasture digging up onions, saw him emerge a little later from the woods and head across the meadow toward the highway. Why, that looks like the nice dull young man that tried to sell me a Bible yesterday, Mrs. Hopewell said, squinting. He must have been selling them to the Negroes back in there. He was so simple, he said, but I guess the world would be better off if we were all that simple. Mrs. Freeman's gaze drove forward and just touched him before he disappeared under the hill. Then she returned her attention to the evil-smelling onion shoot she was lifting from the ground. Some can't be that simple, she said. I know I never could.